My family got me into classic rock at age five with the likes of The Beatles and Carlos Santana. By the time I reached high school, everybody was into new metal. And although I did listen to it in the year 2000, it just didn't hold a candle against the classics. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much. 2001 was a pivotal year. My mom bought me a copy of Led Zeppelin III, and that changed everything. I quit video games, and I was interested in playing the guitar. I had a reason. My world became Zeppelin and guitars, 24 hours, 7 days a week. My classmates thought Linkin Park was the greatest band ever. They tried to convince me it didn't work. Making friends my age was tough. I got music advice from whom I thought were old timers back then. Most of them would stick to Zeppelin's greatest hits for the Remasters collection, aka Pizza Box. Their knowledge on the band was limited and finding a good historian on the matter was hard. 2003, I had the first four albums and I had to wait for either my birthday or a special occasion to get a new record. I had to choose wisely, so I got the latter day CD as a way of completing my collection. This will be my last one, I thought. But of course, denial is the first sign of addiction. Every song was a thrilling discovery, but it was in the evening all my love, the ones that puzzled me. They sounded different. They had synthesizers. It was dark and bittersweet, as if there was a sad story behind the songs. I didn't know what nostalgia was back then, but I felt it. This wasn't the band on my VHS copy of The Song Remains the Same, doing 30 minute runs of Days and Confused, yet it retained the essence and finesse of their greatness. I checked the latter day's booklet and saw a two page photo of their discography. The tracklist didn't say which albums the songs came from, so my research began and I found out about In Through the Outdoor. It got little to no praise in online publications down to a brief comment or bad review. Why was this period barely mentioned in their biographies? What was so wrong about this record? 2004. I started doing weekly visits to a local bookstore downtown. The owner hated Zeppelin's music. I browsed through the used vinyl section and found a copy of the guy sitting at the bar. I didn't have a record player. I didn't care. I just had to have it. I got to a cashier and was shamed for my purchase. Just like a scene from High Fidelity. I had to fight for my music. Can I have it then? No. No, you can't. Why not? Well, it's sentimental tacky crap. That's why not. Two weeks later, same place, same thing. This time I got a used CD version from the 80s. The owner asked me, how does it feel having bad taste? I found out the album was originally sold with a brown paper bag and had six different sleeves. The Zeppelin madness took over. I bought the remaining studio albums, read every article, learned their songs, and played the part of Jimmy Page in Zeppelin tribute bands for 15 years. I got, the more In Through the Outdoor grew on me. It became like a secret society for hardcore Led Zeppelin fans. Fast forward nowadays and I own 32 copies and counting. I have a fever and the only prescription is more copies of In Through the Outdoor. Its influence on 80s synth rock cannot be overlooked. There is no this.
without this. With the help of a British friend who provides her voiceover talents, I hope you enjoyed the video as we dive into the story of Led Zeppelin's final studio album as we go in through the outdoor. Jimmy Page was the chief executive officer with an extra paycheck as the band's producer. Peter Grant was chief operation officer running both Led Zeppelin and Swan Song, they were the leaders calling the shots. Led Zeppelin's unofficial breakup occurred on July 27, 1977, after a four-day period of extreme tension, violence and death. This was no time off, they stopped working, and management tried to hide it from the press as much as possible. Times were changing music production was evolving and the industry was catching up. Jimmy was 35. Known as Pagey in the Zeppelin camp, he financed their first album in 1969. He was the guy in the Yardbirds who toured the United States long before his Zeppelin bandmates. He knew how to use the studio as musical instrument. From 1968 to 1973 he was untouchable and his guitar technique legendary. He was the older brother who made things possible, Peter Grant was the father and had a favorite child and Jimmy, the other three were junior partners. John Bonham, Bonzo, was 31. A team player who followed orders, he was Zeppelin's biggest fan and cornerstone, he may have had a Jekyll and Hyde personality, but he loved the group dearly and never crossed Jimmy the wrong way. He had the best guitar ears to complement Page's riffs. He was Jones' rhythm section musical soulmate and Robert's brother from the early days in the black country. Peter Grant saw a version of himself in Bonham's wild temper. Back in 68 though, Bonzo wasn't sure about joining Page's new project, he just couldn't leave his weekly gigs, he had a family and needed the money, so Zeppelin put him on salary until 1970. John Paul Jones was 33, his bandmates knew him as Jonasy. A multi-instrumentalist who could deliver the goods on bass guitar, electric organ, electric piano, harp, clavinet, double bass, mellotron, keyboards, mandolin, triple neck guitar, flute recorder, lap steel guitar, ukulele, sitter, banjo and cello. Both his parents were professional musicians. His father encouraged him to learn to read and write music, a skill which would prove invaluable in his career. By 1968 he had choirmaster and orchestral arrangement experience, plus being a famous session player. His Zeppelin chops never suffered, a musical wizard who was the glue that held the pieces together and didn't get as much writing credits as one would expect.
whether conscious or not, he needed change and well-deserved recognition for his monumental contributions. Robert Plant was 31. His nickname was Percy. Despite his iconic voice and mighty stage presence, he never had much saying or political power in Led Zeppelin up to this point. In the eyes of management, he was still the guy that Page and Grant discovered back in 68. Even when I kissed you He would slowly question his life outside the dysfunctional family. Robert lost his son and Bonham stood by his side. Carrack's funeral was held on the first week of August 1977. The others didn't go, John Paul Jones, Jimmy Page and Peter Grant were absent. This was the turning point for Plant, he stepped back and went into isolation. If a career in music was to be, it would be on his terms and his terms only. The brotherhood was gone, Bonham remained his only friend within Zeppelin. Robert had one foot outside the door. Plant and Jones were never best friends, both would take small jabs at each other through the years. To quote Peter Grant, we were sharing a cab in Munich 1975, it was freezing outside, Robert was behind his lyrics, and apologized to Jonasy who said, Personally Robert, I've never bothered to listen to the lyrics on any of our albums. 1978's collaboration between Plant and Jones seemed impossible, but if we take a closer look, it was a chance to put aside any differences and work together to serve their personal interests. A new Zeppelin was born. Two of them awakened, two of them dazed and confused. Jones got artistic power. Robert wanted out the ship and be the captain simultaneously. The great calamity of In Through the Outdoor is to be the only album from this new working model to see the light of day. A music statement and greeting to New Decade, and we only got a glimpse of it. It was their comeback. It was a reunion album. Plant's alliance with Jones proved elusive as he would never work with him again, Jones found out about the unedited project through the papers. He would thank his bandmates in 1995. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd just like to add also my thanks to Peter Grant who gave us the freedom to do what we did. And um, also, thank you, my friends, for finally remembering my phone number. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>
Jones cut his hair short and wore white during Zepp's last tour, so did Greg Lake on their final run in 78. Last but not least, Zeppelin did tour rehearsals at Mantica Studios, a music facility owned by Emerson, Lake and Palmer. With him spending more and more time sitting down at concerts, in through the outdoor was the natural extension of his abilities. The album was their biggest change in sound since Led Zeppelin III in 1970. Oh by the way, it was John Paul Jones who came up with his riffs. Suddenly one of the finest and most sophisticated music studios in the world, it opened its doors in May 1978. The masterplan came from the genius duo of Bjorn Olvi Urs and Benny Anderson from legendary pop sensation ABBA and their manager Stikken Anderson. The premise was simple. Assemble a studio that had the right gear, facilities, and competence for it all. Word spread rapidly in the music community. Genesis held its 1979 Duke Sessions plus their bandmates Mike Rutherford's and Tony Banks' solo albums. In the words of Led Zeppelin's manager, Peter Grant, Abba came to us and offered it, it was actually a slot to do it, we used to get the noon flight on Monday, and then return on Friday for the weekend, it was cold and dark all the time. Jones and Plant worked by day with Bonzo and Page completing their parts by night. Benny Anderson owned Yamaha GX1, so the band wouldn't have to fly Jones' keyboard up to Sweden. Some of Jones' sound presets on the GX1 were later used on ABBA's 1979 release. Recording dates for and through the outdoor took place from November 14 through November 23. An additional overdubbing session took place on December 19. Final mixes for the album were done at Polar on February 1979. The band cut 10 songs. Leif Maces worked as engineer for the sessions at Polar Studios. Maces was interviewed years later and said that he would make work in progress cassette tapes for the band members, as proof for their wives, that their time in Sweden was actually productive when returning on the weekends back to England. November 15, 1978. Led Zeppelin was about to record for the first time since 1975, history was in the making. A miracle many thought would never happen. What took them so long and what was the road that led up to this moment?